Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson on my show, Author to Author. Tonight, I'm here with Pat Flynn, and he has written a very uh, interesting book called The Best Argument for God. And uh, how are you tonight, Pat? I'm doing very well, Cynthia. Thank you so much for having me on your program. Well, I've, I've been looking forward to it. <laughs> you know, so I've heard your name a few times. So apparently, you're getting to be well known in the Catholic circles. Oh boy! <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> have to quickly engage in expectations management, I suppose. But <laughs> yep. yes, <laughs> yep. So um, yeah, if you'd like to start us with a prayer, we can jump right into the interview. Sure, I'd be delighted. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, thank you for bringing us together today. Please guide our conversation. Please help us to speak with clarity and charity and present the best case we can um, in defense of, of not just your existence, but your goodness and your love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name amen. of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Excuse me. For our audience, just so you'll know, I've been sick. That's why I sound so terrible. Anyway, um, so <clears throat> what is it that led you to write this book? Yeah, thanks, Cynthia. Well, it's a, it's a lot of things. So for people who are unfamiliar uh, with me, I don't know what people may have heard in these Catholic circles that you speak of about me, but for people who are unfamiliar, um, <clears throat> I spent many years, especially in my sort of early formative philosophical years, not a religious person, not even a philosophical theist. I would have sort of classified myself as a as an atheistic naturalist. And uh, it was really not uh, by encountering any religious people or even hearing any good arguments for God that I gave that up, but through a sort of sustained study of the naturalistic worldview and looking at the different ranges of options for trying to make sense of very basic features of the world, features that I think are definitely real, right? The moral, the moral dimension, consciousness, free will, and seeing that at pretty much every point, um, naturalism, and for pe people who aren't familiar, naturalism is just sort of a philosophically developed form of, of atheism, that at every point, naturalism failed to provide any sort of adequate account, at least that would satisfy my intellect. And, and uh, fairly often what you would find... Um, among naturalist thinkers and philosophers is not even an explanation of certain things that we take as basic features of reality, uh, but in explaining them away, right? So you'll have naturalists that argue for nihilism, that morality is all an illusion. You'll have ones that even go further and argue for what's called eliminativism about consciousness, that even you don't exist, right? That even consciousness is an illusion. So it gets pretty, it gets pretty wacky pretty fast. Um, yep. so, so yeah, I gave, I gave that up. Um, and at that point in my life, I, I realized, um, or I admitted, I should say, remember I was actually sitting in like my attic at my house at the time. I threw my hands up. I said, I don't know what's true, but I'm pretty sure this isn't it. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. so anyways, um, many, many years later, you know, um, I, I come fully into, into the Catholic faith and uh people have sort of found my i guess philosophical journey interesting and sometimes apologetically useful uh and i had i have been wanting to to write a a a book in defense of classical theism for a long time and what really inspired this project Cynthia was um unsurprisingly as he inspires many uh people who come to faith usually through the avenue of philosophy is Thomas Aquinas and mm -hmm. if you if you go to his his summa and you go to the the section on the existence of God, what's mm -hmm. curious about that is he only lists two objections. And this is curious because you know Thomas sometimes has a whole museum of objections to positions, yeah. but but for something like God's existence, which is a really big important thing, he's only got two right. And and one of them is the problem of evil. Most people are familiar with that. If if God, then why so many negative states of affairs? Very important question. And I have a lot to say about that in the book, but it wasn't what um, inspired my book. It was actually the other objection, uh, the one that I think doesn't uh, get as, as much attention. And that objection is something like this. It's essentially, hey, the principles of nature are enough. We don't actually need God to explain anything. Uh, and mm -hmm. the interesting thing about this objection is it's it's sort of probably... The objection I would have given, if you would have asked me 
you know, why I was inclined to naturalism way, way back. I wouldn't have articulated it the same way as Aquinas, but I probably would have said something like science has got this, you know, science can do it, right? Mm-hmm. We don't, we don't need mm-hmm. to go beyond the science and science doesn't say anything about God. Uh, yeah. But other, other naturalists might, might formulate it um, as follows. They might say something like this, Cynthia. They might say, hey, if, if two theories explain just as much, believe the simpler theory. Well, guess what? Theism and atheism, they're on an explanatory par, but atheism or naturalism is simpler. So let's go with that. And I, li- I like that objection. It's not a it's not a positive disproof of God, but it's supposed to be a good reason to prefer naturalism over theism as a sort of philosophical paradigm. And what I wanted my book to be was not just a um, a dismantling of that argument, but a, but a reversal of it. So my entire thesis is essentially this: um, naturalism can only explain some, but not all of what theism can but only when strapped with vastly greater complexity. So believe theism. And then the whole project of the book is just lining up all the explanatory targets that I think a worldview needs to explain, contingency, mm-hmm. consciousness, morality, stability, order, and indeed suffering and evil. And I make the case at, at every section, every chapter, that theism is in some cases the only conceivable or possible explanation. In other cases, it's the better simpler explanation sorry that was a very long-winded response but also i'll pause there (laughs) hopefully that gets the Mm -hmm. gist of it yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no it's it's interesting because i think um i wasn't an atheist i was uh, jewish and i converted back when i was about 38 39 years old yeah i converted because of a religious experience and the thing that fascinates me about this religion and of course i firmly believe it's true is the fact that we're dealing with a being that is persons you know it's like so there is this chance for intimacy you know conversation direction you know um that uh you're not going to get out of coal philosophy or most of the world religions actually (laughs) Yeah, that that's that's right, and that's 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 a wonderful insight. I mean, at the end of the day, mm-hmm. what is fundamental for Christianity? I mean, it's it's God, yes, but it's it's actually persons, right? So for naturalists, it something works. physical is fundamental, particles maybe, or fields, mm-hmm. or something like that, right? But for for Christians, it's persons. Persons are fundamental. It's yeah. a remarkable thing to think about, right? And then it we is. can ask, well, can can philosophy get you there? I don't know. Uh, probably not. It can get you to, you know, the 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 god of the philosophers, the purely actual reality. Mm-hmm. But can it can it get you to the trinity of persons? Aquinas thinks not. Right. Um, he thinks that that's something that God needs to sort of reveal to us. What mm-hmm. philosophy can do is just kind of take down objections to it to show that it's not absurd or it's it's not incoherent. But I think your your point is remarkable in the sense that, it, to me, anyways, once you once you kind of stumble upon that. It's uh, it's an invitation, yeah. if you will, right? It's an invitation in a way that the God of the philosophers, not exactly sure what to do with that, right? And like, neither did Aristotle, really. He never thought that like we could be friends with his God, at least, or anything like that, right? That would that would almost be beneath the Aristotelian unmoved mover to come down and hang, want to be intimate with us in any sense. So, I think that's I think that's insightful because even though a lot of the classical philosophy inspired me, um. The fundamental sort of notion of of of, of relationship, or what mm-hmm. the end of of the human uh, you know sort of nature is, is radically different in the Catholic worldview than it is the pagan worldview. There's no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and I mean, when you think of it, I mean, we are just a bundle of relationships. <laughs> I don't mean that as like this. There's no substance to us. But, you know, you have relationships with your boss, with your co-workers, with people right. under you. You have relationships with your spouse, your kids, your parents. I mean, that's all we do. We have relationships. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so that, of course, I think is because we're made in the image and likeness of God. So, I mean, God has relationships. He is relationship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yeah. And you know, that, just, that just fascinates me. You know? you know, one of my uh, great inspirations is Father Norris Clark, if anybody or is familiar with him and, and his whole analysis of, of of existence is just to be in relation, right? It's a, a substance is just to be in relation. And I think that's right. And I think it, it is a sort of a mirroring of the of the divine image at the end of the day, right? So 
yeah, persons are fundamental and to, and to be a substance is just to be in relation. Uh, mm -hmm. I totally agree with all that. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we look, we look for that all the time. I mean, it's like, even with, with other creation, you know, it's like, I have a gigantic Angora cat sitting here. Wow. And, really? <laughs> oh yeah. I'd like to see that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yeah. There's her whole body. <laughs> yeah it doesn't even fit on screen that's great yeah. <laughs> but you know it's like you we we build relations relationships in quotation marks with things that are subhuman yes no the brutes because, mm -hmm. because that's what we enjoy is relation yeah what's your what's your cat's name uh lulu because she is insane yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah she, we've had we uh i've had her since last um October, I accidentally killed my other cat. I got oh. up. And, oh, I got up in the morning, didn't turn the light on, stepped on her head, killed her. Oh, oh, wow, that's <laughs> awful. That's. <laughs> I couldn't even believe that happened. Yeah. But anyway, um. So my husband and I, I mean, it was uh, it was an accident. I would never hurt him. Yeah, of course. But um, but we went to uh, Animal Rescue League to get another cat. Yeah. And he fell in love with this cat. And I'll tell you, I was afraid of her because she was so big, you know. And anyway, so she, the, he got her in the container, and he he was starting to decline. Uh, yeah. Remember, so I um, God rest him. Yeah, thank you. So I picked her up and I I bent at the knees, thinking I'm going to throw my back out. The cat looks like she's thirty pounds. Looks like a boulder. Yeah. She weighs nine pounds. It's all fur. It's all fur. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Yeah, I'm I'm quite inclined to the big furry, fluffy Persian type of yeah. cats. Yeah, but somebody commented on one of my videos recently. They said if 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 all the cats were the size of lions, we'd all be dead. I guess like hinting that they're not like as domesticated as as we think. They're there's actually little ferocious things. But I guess because they're kind of small, we we can we can survive their attacks or something like that, right? I don't know. I don't own a cat. Yeah. Oh, they're really not. They're lovable creatures. They become they become ferocious if they're hurt. Sure. And this cat had been abused. That's why she was in the Animal Rescue League. <clears throat> so it took a while for her to uh, to calm down. But she loved uh, loved my husband. And after he died, you know, she would stand by his closet and scream, mm. looking for him because mm -hmm. she could smell clothes but she couldn't find where he was. And sure. it's like, you know, so, I mean, I know that she's not thinking like we do, but it is, it's, it's kind of interesting to see how she bonded with him. Yeah. Yeah. You know? it, tugs, it tugs at the heartstrings too, doesn't it? It yeah. does. It certainly does. But she's a beautiful animal. Anyway, back at, back at the interview, which is definitely more important. Than <laughs> yeah. I'll talk about cats all day, but yeah, wherever you want to go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so give me a kind of overview of the book. So sure. That, yeah. Yeah. Great. So the the book has um two major sections, and um for people who are unfamiliar with philosophical approaches to God, you know, there's there's several, but there's there's two that have always interested me. There's the sort of traditional approach that you find among thinkers like you know Plato and Aristotle and. St. Thomas, obviously. And what they're doing is they're starting in philosophy of nature or metaphysics. And they're just, you know, they're kind of carving reality at its joints and they're trying to understand certain broad features of the world. Like what is change, right? Mm -hmm. How do things endure through time? And they posit these various sort of explanatory entities and divisions of being, right? Uh, act and potency, um, substance and attribute or form and matter, stuff like that, right? We don't have to worry about the details now, but the point is for, for their approach, what they're doing is they're just, they're just kind of starting with what's in front of them and saying, okay, for this to actually be the case or to be intelligible, here's the kind of system we need to, to explain it, right? And then to hold that entire system up, for that entire system to be there, we need this other thing. And that other thing is, is God, the unmoved mover, the purely actual reality, so on and so forth. So a lot of the traditional philosophers are starting with, uh, they're running what are called metaphysical demonstrations. Sometimes they're starting with some very basic, some might argue undeniable feature of experience, such as there are changing things, or there are composite things, things made of parts, or there are contingent things. And what they'll argue 
often through a complicated chain of reasoning, but often a very impressive one, is that if there if there are going to be changing things, there has to be at least one unchanging thing, right? To explain it. If there are if there are going to be composite things, there has to be at least one ultimately absolutely simple thing to explain it. If there are going to be contingent things, there has to be at least one ultimately necessary thing, something that could not not exist to explain why there are any of these contingent things at all. So for the traditional philosophers, you kind of see that if they that if that they argue if the world is going to actually make sense, if it's completely intelligible, if we can get a sort of explanation of everything, then we're going to need to make a pretty profound category shift, right? From the changing to the unchanging, from the composite to the simple, from the contingent to necessary. And then through another chain of reasoning around like what a necessary or absolutely simple thing would be, they sort of tease out the divine attributes and argue that something like that would be primary in the order of causality. It would be one and only one. Its nature is such that it couldn't be multiplied. Um, it would be unchanging, eternal, outside of time, omnipotent. It would be uh, mm -hmm. the being that can bring about all possible realities, but itself is uncaused, so on and so forth, right? So that's call that the traditional approach. This is where you kind of start, again, in philosophy of nature, metaphysics, and you argue through a deductive chain to the unmoved mover, the unactualized actualizer, so on and so forth. I've always liked that approach. It's a bit complicated, but I think it's a, it, it's a, it's a very forceful approach, and it also gives you a very philosophically refined understanding of God. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I develop one of those arguments in the first section of my book, mostly concerned with contingency, but also taking in considerations of compositeness to get to, uh, I argue, a classical theistic perspective. But then what I do in the back half of the book is I actually shift methodology. And this is where there's um, a more contemporary approach to the God debate. And this is where philosophers engage in sort of inference to the best explanation or worldview comparison. And what they do is they essentially craft a worldview hypothesis. And for your listeners, a worldview is just sort of a philosophical big picture of everything, right? And they'll say, okay, this is my hypothesis, and and this is this is sort of the root theory. Now let's be scientific about it. Let's go out and like compare these rival hypotheses and see which one better predicts or anticipates. There's sort of, you know, broad features of the world that we think a worldview needs to predict mm -hmm. or anticipate. Things like contingency or consciousness or morality or, you know, evolution and suffering and pain and, and all that, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so and then they'll then they'll make the case, you know, depending on what theory they're attached to of why they think their theory better explains certain data than others and, you know, why it has other theoretical virtues of being not ad hoc and simple in the relevant respects and and so they kind of go back and forth over that right and th the two primary competitors i'm i'm concerned with are of course theism and naturalism um but my so so anyways you have philosophers that kind of do it one way or the other but my thought has always been well these these approaches can certainly be harmonious there's there's no reason to to, to go just in for one so I always thought you could do what I do in this book, you know, use the first approach to actually shape your hypothesis and like give a really good initial case for it. But then now you have something that you can go out and you can test it, if you will, you know, mm -hmm. with the other data in comparison to its what I think is its primary contender of a metaphysical naturalism. And so at that point, you know, I use contingency to sort of shape the hypothesis in the first section to and you know, I actually think it's a demonstration, but I say, in case you're not convinced, there's there's more. Let's go see, you know, how this hypothesis compares to naturalism for explaining consciousness or semantic content or moral knowledge. Or, and of course, the problem of evil is the final section at the end. And that, uh, again, is is where each 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 of those sort of explanatory targets has an entire chapter uh, dedicated to it. And depending on which one we're talking about, I'll make the case that theism is the only possible explanation or if naturalism is going to give an explanation it's going to be an exceedingly ad hoc and complicated one and for that reason it should not be preferred yeah mm -hmm. hmm. wow it's a long book it's 256 pages so there's a lot of territory I, covered <laughs> yeah i was just wondering to myself i thought that that had to take a lot of words <laughs> <laughs> yeah it did and a lot of them got cut too so uh <laughs> <laughs> That's so, okay. Yeah. 
so the <laughs> reader will be thankful for sure right uh-huh mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but i wanted yeah. to be i wanted to be as comprehensive as i could without without producing a a, a you know an extremely tedious academic book i wanted this book to be uh, called a middle brow effort because i've mm-hmm. noticed in the when it comes to books you know on philosophy of god or arguments for god or even apologetics there's not a lot uh that i think is actually particularly good um there's a lot that's kind of superficial um misses the mark uh sometimes just gets things wrong uh but then there's a lot of stuff being done by professional philosophers theistic ones i think is superb but Mm -hmm. it's stuff that's never going to reach the general public and the general right. public would have no idea what to make of it anyway. So I always thought, well, maybe we can kind of hit something in the middle there where I'll, I'll take what I think is the best stuff that I know of happening mm-hmm. at the kind of more academic level, trying to still it without diluting it. Let the reader know that, hey, this is this isn't going to be easy. It's still a challenge. But if you're interested in this stuff, I'm going to I'm going to really help you through it. So I do make demands of the reader early on. Mm-hmm. It's not a it's not it's not a kitty book. Uh, but I also, you know, I present things in the simplest way that I know how, and I have sidebars and deeper explanations for the more technical points. So if somebody is seriously interested in this stuff, um, I think they're going to get a lot out of it. Uh, I think also if people like to be challenged by, by books as well, I think they're going to get a lot out of it, but it's also a book that, that, um, could be kind of taken as a buffet you know people might find just one section interesting i don't think they need to read it start to finish to get something out of it people might just be like okay i'm I'm interested in the consciousness question how does that connect to god or i'm interested in the morality question how does that connect to god they could probably just dive right in there and get what they want and and then get out as well Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i understand it's that's it's really fascinating i mean how long did this take you to write yeah, it's been a long project. So, you know, not counting all the false starts and stuff when I was initially brainstorming and just trying to get ideas together before I even pitched the book. But, you know, once the once the contract was signed and, and all that, probably, yeah, probably about a year and a half, I would mm-hmm. say, you know, mm-hmm. there, like I said, a lot was cut as well. So, yeah. And rightfully so. <laughs> and rightfully so. It was well, it was it was long enough. So so there was more in there originally than made the final cut, but who knows? Maybe we'll get the extended edition at some point, you know, the director's cut. We'll see how we'll see how the original does first. Well, that's I think it's pretty normal when you're right, because you want to get every idea down and you want to give it its justice. But uh ultimately a lot of those things aren't going to be interesting to every reader. Ain't that the truth? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's so true. Yeah, I have to stop being so selfish when I write these projects because, of course, I'm you know I'm inclined, as you just mentioned, to always write about the things that I'm most interested in at the moment, and, and sometimes we those are, are. And so, sometimes those are very obscure objections, right? <laughs> like like in the tall grass of metaphysics, and just you know, even if I think they're important, they're not always immediately appropriate for most people. So that's why having a good editor can help a lot brings you back down to earth for sure Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. that's the truth i I wrote my memoir and i had a friend read through it um and uh she chopped gigantic pieces out but it was a much better book for that yeah and that's hard to do too because you get attached of course to to your writing and your projects and sometimes you might think ah i nailed i did think that i nailed that objection i crushed it but then the editor's like this doesn't so this shouldn't actually be in here at all. <laughs> like oh, that hurts, but you're right. <laughs> take it out, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's how I felt. It's like, let's take out these five years of your life. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm kind yeah. of you know? Yeah, me- memoirs are a little bit different because that's even more personal. So I'm sure that's 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 uh that's probably a bit yeah, a bit harder to let go of something from a memoir than a philosophy mm-hmm. of God book, to be sure, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it is, you know, I don't think any book, I mean, there are people that are geniuses and can write things that probably don't need much editing, but the majority of writers need someone else to look at the work because we think we're communicating exactly what we want to, but it might not be understandable to someone else. You know, that's what one of the reasons that you have an editor, you know, it's yeah. like, does mm-hmm. this 
across the way you want it to or clearly, you know, so. Yeah. And there's the problem of knowledge too, especially, you know, the, the more specialized you become in a certain subject area, yeah. right? The, the more you forget how much you know compared yeah. to most people. And not to say, it's not to say that other people are, are stupid. It's just that this is your area of specialization. And yeah. so you forget that. And then when you start to try to communicate it, there's such a, there's such a chasm between you and them that the communication is can become almost impossible, really. So you really do need somebody who is not a good editor, but hopefully actually doesn't have that level of knowledge that you do. So they yeah. can they can flag it for you and say, okay, I have I have no idea what you're talking about here, right? You need to <laughs> you need to yeah. write this entire section. Right. Unfortunately I did have such an editor. He was a very smart guy. Yeah. But also not, you know, specialized mm -hmm. in this area. So he's really helpful, really helpful to have somebody like that on the team. Absolutely invaluable. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You're right. Mm -hmm. So, so what are you going to do now? Are you going to write another uh, philosophy book, or hopefully not anytime soon? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, as, as I'm sure you know, you know, uh, for I don't know how many years it, it took off my life, but I imagine that, that it took some good number of years off my life writing this book. Uh, they're very painful, ex exceedingly painful. And this is this isn't my first book. This is my fifth or sixth book, something like that. Oh. Um, so yeah, and you know, at the end of every one, I always I always swear I'm never going to do it again. Yeah, you know, this is it. Um, mm -hmm. and then you know, six months later, I've I've begun the next one because I can't I can't help myself. So no immediate plans to write another book, but knowing my my personal history, I'm sure some idea will will pop into my mind, or I'll, I'll get bored two weeks from now and feel like I need to uh, uh, to do it again. I don't know what it, I don't know what it would be on at this point um, immediately, anyways. Because the nice thing about about this book and the way that it's set up, you know, the way that it's kind of framed as a as a worldview uh, comparison book, is it really allowed me to treat. Um, a lot of different positions. And there were some areas, uh, you know, going into the book, there were some areas that I felt really good on there, you know, there, there are areas in um, natural theology that, you know, I've, I've been in that area for years, I, I, I feel like I understand the literature really well. Um, I, you know, I, I, it, that those sections were fairly easy for me. But there were other sections of the book that, you know, I, I have a general understanding. Um mm -hmm. For example, philosophy of mind. Um, but, you know, I didn't want to just present my general understanding. I wanted to do a good job. So the book really forced me to go a lot deeper and mm -hmm. to do, you know, some some heavy research and to kind of, uh, you know, kind of catch up to where I, th I think the contemporary debate is and, and this or that. Uh, all that being said is that the book allowed me to kind of explore in terms of you know philosophy religion all the stuff i'm interested in right i didn't really have to leave anything else so it's not like oh now i got to go write a book on this i mean this book i mean i maybe a, another book could allow me to expand on certain sections and make a book out of something that was just a chapter mm -hmm. uh but this book was it was very self-indulgent because i got to explore you know all the stuff that that really interests me and has interested me mm -hmm. for a long time you know mm -hmm. whether whether concerning you know um yeah, the, the, just the, the human person, the nature of the human person, morality, mm -hmm. consciousness, and of course, you know, cosmological reasoning arguments for this is God, this or that. So, yeah, I guess I guess if I were to do anything after this, it, it might just be to take a particular section of the book um, mm -hmm. and and further further develop. Maybe the one on on the problem of evil because that's a very long one, and I still don't think I said everything I wanted to say in that section. So I could see that being a future project at some point. Mm -hmm. But for now, of course, the plan is, uh, you know, once it, once the book's about ready to launch, the publisher always puts you on the rounds to promote it. You got to sell the thing too, unfortunately, right? You can't just you can't just write it. <laughs> so now the, yeah, I don't want to say I don't I don't like the promotionals because it's fun. I get to have conversations like this, so it's it is it is fun to do mm -hmm. the promotional stuff. I guess I just like the writing the writing side a little bit more, as I'm sure most authors do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. So interesting. So I just, uh, I just, yeah, I don't think you should stop. I think you should take a break and then you should go back and do something else fantastic. 
you know, really, if you if you've got the ability to talk about all the things that you've just talked to me about, and to be able to communicate them, you know, you should keep going. Thank you. That's that's very kind and very encouraging. And uh, I don't know if I have a choice in it. You know, I think for uh, it doesn't seem to be peculiar to me. Um, but you know, philosophy is sort of that is sort of that thing that I realized, you know, I was always into before I, I knew that there was a term for it. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I can think, you know, my earliest, some of my earliest memories looking outside my grandparents' window, you know, wondering how do I know any of this is real? You know, having these kind of deep existential oh. questions and thinking that I was just super weird. Right. And then you realize, Oh, wow. There's other people that had all these weird questions too. And they, they, they thought about it long before I did, and they thought a lot about it a lot better than I did. And those people were called philosophers. <laughs> so you kind of realize, oh, that's what I that's that's what I'm into. That's kind of what I want to do. So it's always it's always been with me. <laughs> it's not something I think you I can get away from. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I actually argue that in the book, right? Philosophy is something that nobody can get away from on some level, right? We all have a worldview, we all have a lens, we all have yeah. value commitments. The only question is whether you're gonna you're gonna do it well, not whether you're gonna do it at all. Yeah. Uh, but for some people, they seem to be born with a particular itch that this is just this is just sort of the mode you're in, and that's true for me. So yeah, I need to like get a cat and chill out for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Think about what the next project will be. You know. Yeah. Take a little take a little break, and then mm-hmm. get back to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. Good. We all do need breaks. There's no question. You know, I wrote I wrote my memoir and then I took a break and I thought, well, you, can, you really can't write two memoirs. Well, maybe you can. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, Wait, where's, the, where's the rule? You can't write two memoirs. I've never seen that. Well, well, you know, if you tell your life story, you know, that means you can only work on what you haven't talked about over the last year. Yeah. But well, no. you know, yeah, well, I'm sure I'm sure this is obviously the case. I've never written a memoir, but, you know, people have asked me many times about, you know, how, you know, I fell away from any sort of religion and then came back. And I realized that every time I sort of rehearse it, you know, you just remember different aspects of the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not like I'm telling a different story. It's just like, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. so something pops back in your mind. You're like, ah, and then you see how that connects to other things that you did remember and the story takes on a new perspective and a new light and you know so you know mm-hmm. with just when you understand that you could totally see how you could write multiple memoirs right there's always mm-hmm. different sort of you know frames from kind of seeing your own life and mm-hmm. right, absolutely. Uh, it is interesting because um you know as long as you're alive things keep happening and uh you know, your take on them as you, as you, as you, we all change, I think, to some extent, as we grow older, we either become, you know, more aware of something or, you know, uh, maybe we grow a little uh, more conservative, something like that. But um, it's interesting to look at the same thing through lens lenses at a different point in time. Yes. You know, and so that kind, it's not that, memoir one is wrong it's that you've grown Mm -hmm. and that's something that needs to be analyzed but yeah it's uh it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to be a writer yes yeah it is it's a challenging thing too i've heard people say that they think writing is easy it's never been easy for me no not Uh, at all i think people who say that I don't know how much I actually write. It's a very, it's a very, very difficult thing. Um, <laughs> it's almost impossible if it's on a subject you're not interested in. But when it's a subject you are interested in, it's still a very, very difficult thing. Yes. Um, you know, just like just like any skill or craft, right? Mm-hmm. They're, all, they're all difficult. At least if you want to be good at them, they're yeah. All, they're all difficult. They're all exacting. They all, you know, take their their pound of flesh from you. Yeah. Uh, but I guess we feel that it's it's worth it at the end of the day to try and make that contribution. Hmm. Mm-hmm. It is, and it's, I think we wouldn't be happy inside if we didn't. Yeah. You know, yeah. in some ways, being I think that the things that we do, you know, for, I mean, there's a difference between working because you need money right, and for fulfillment. 
Yes. Um, I think the people that work all day and then come home and sit down and work at writing something like that, it shows that dichotomy. You know, there's, there's something that you need to do for money mm -hmm. and then something else that is entirely just like stuck in your soul and heart, you know, <laughs> no I know it. Mm -hmm. it. so, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Very, yeah. yeah, very different for some people. I mean, I look at some people, they seem to just pick up a pen and the stuff flows out. I've never been like that. <laughs> you know, I use an, I use an eraser a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so do I. Yeah, well, back the backspace button more for me, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're friendly, me and the backspace button. Yeah, and, and some days are the writing process for me is, you know, I'm, I'm pretty monotonous. I have my time every day. This is, this is just when I'm writing, you know, and it's day by day, you know, S some days you have a good day, right? Mm -hmm. you, you get a lot out and, and yeah, things sort of flow. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been a musician for most of my life too. So I, I see it sort of, you know, a lot of parallels with writing and music. Some, some days on the guitar, things feel good. The notes flow, you improvise yep. well, uh, but those days, like those, those spectacular days are few and far between, you know, you also have really bad days, you know, you can hardly get out a paragraph, you can hardly hit a right note. Um, and then you have most of it, a lot is somewhere in between mm -hmm. th those extremes, right? Yeah. Um, and what I've learned uh, through doing this, at least for a little while, is that it's just it just is a numbers game. You just mm -hmm. show up every day and you you put in the effort and you rejoice when you have those great days and you just accept when you have the bad days, but you just keep pecking away and you, you keep plucking away or whatever you're doing. And if you're just, if you're just consistent at it, that's, that's how you ultimately, yep. that's how you get it done. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I agree. Yep. It's kind of like, sometimes I hate the typewriter, <laughs> you know, but in the end it's your friend. Right. Yeah. Some days you look for every excuse not to go sit down and, yeah, yeah. Start doing yep. it, right? Yeah, I've got to do this, got to do that, right? Laundry, no, no, no. <laughs> Just putting off what you know you need to do, right? Uh huh. I love to do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, well, when you do write something again, like your next book, make sure you talk to Sebastian so that we can do another interview. Yeah, that would be great. I've really enjoyed this, uh, Cynthia. Thanks oh, a lot for okay. having me on your program. Thank you for being on it. So I've enjoyed it too. Because sometimes people click. It's awful when they don't. And you're on film, you know. Oh, yeah. I get it. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we click. That's good. <laughs> so anyway. But yeah, make sure that uh, that you let Sebastian or me know if you write something or when you write something else. And we'll do another interview. That sounds great. I would enjoy it very much. So would I. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, th it'll be make sure I say a prayer for your your health and your asthma you, that you're doing better now. And yeah, I am. I'm still taking albuterol. I'm going to turn into an albuterol chemical. I guess <laughs> sure, yeah. Albuterol. <laughs> but other than that, I'm okay. Good. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, um, if you'd like to close us in a prayer, yes, absolutely. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, thank you for bringing us here together for this conversation and for, uh, yeah, just the wonderful opportunity uh, to hopefully ar articulate, you know, some of the, I think, very good reasons uh, for for faith, for belief, and obviously, importantly, for hope as well. And please bless the listeners as well in their lives as they continue to search for and better understand your truth. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the interview. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Cynthia. Yep. We will talk to you again sometime. Take care. Right. Take care.